Number five, and I'm going to come at this kind of uh, a little backwards probably than some of you think. I'm just going to read the passage, and then we're going to do a dance. Not a literal one, because you don't want to see me dance. So we're in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now if we left it right there, that'd be a little lopsided, wouldn't it? Because, you know, God is speaking to the wives, and, and if God just left it there, he didn't have a word for husbands, it would, it would be uh, definitely unbalanced. But God doesn't stop there. Speaking through Paul, he continues in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. <coughs> now, looking at this, in today's culture, what's the hot button word here? Oh, wow, that was quick. <laughs> I didn't hear a male voice there. I just heard females. Um, let's jump over to Colossians 3. Uh, Paul wrote these letters at the same time. Uh, they were actually both entrusted to the same men to deliver them to the proper churches. And, and we can tell that Paul's thinking was flowing along similar lines from Ephesians to Colossians. And so in Colossians, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, Paul says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That's it. Evidently, the Colossians didn't need as much um, teaching as the Ephesians did. Um, so we see, basically, everything that he said in Ephesians is summarized in two sentences. Um, flip with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to hit that one, and then I'm going to start talking about these. And uh, you'll notice that there are very few hard objects around here that people can hurl at me. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to Lori um, for getting the church decorated and those that helped her, but also because uh, she knows I'm kind of a stickler for the nativity. And if you'll notice that today it was rearranged from what it was last week. Can anybody explain the significance to me of where the nativity is set up? The Magi are elsewhere? Where are the Magi? On the east side. They're not there. They're certainly not at the birth and in the stable. They came later. So where are they? They're in the east. So if you look geographically, the Magi are to the east. Okay? Lori, thank you. That blessed my heart this morning. Um, so, our, our Magi got lost and they're currently up north somewhere at our house. Um, they're taking the long way around. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Peter is writing, he says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that... Even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. 
when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the wearing or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable, imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. <coughs> All right. So, in each of these passages, what are the authors, what is God speaking through the authors to the women? Respect and honor. Respect and honor. Submit, submit to their husbands. Submit. When you think of submit, what pops into your head? Doormat. What's that? Doormat. Doormat. <laughs> okay. Is, yeah, subservience. Is that a possibility? In, in today's world, you know. That's world. absolutely. You guys are right on target. In our culture, when we hear submit, that's what we think about. It, it's almost always with a negative connotation. It's as though you are less than. But that's not what the Bible is saying at all. Not at all. Why do you suppose that God felt it was important that on three different occasions in the New Testament, he tells wives to submit and respect? Why do you suppose that is? For protection. For protection. Well, what would be the natural tendency that that would need to be stated? That they were not submitting. That they're, submitting is not an easy thing. Male or female, okay? As a matter of fact, uh, in another passage that, that if we get to it today, that's fine, um, uh, that we are all told to submit. We're, we're told to submit to one another. We're told to submit to the governing authorities. authorities. Um, so God, on three different occasions in the New Testament, speaks to women, and he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, Respect your husbands. Wives, show your husbands honor. It's interesting that in... Uh, well, let, let's turn there real quick. I just want to... I'm wandering here for a second. Bear with me. Uh, Proverbs. We're in uh, chapter 31. Thirty-one. Yeah. So in Proverbs 31, we see a little bit uh, of a different idea here than the rest of the Proverbs. Uh, the intro actually tells us that these are the words of King Lemuel, who is what? Solomon. Another name for Solomon. Uh, and it says, an oracle that his mother taught him. Okay? So, this is Bathsheba, her of ill repute, speaking to her son. And in this, she gives him the requirements, the guidelines, the outline, if you will, of what he should look for in a woman. Okay? Um, so in verse 10, now, you know, this, this is actually, I think it's really cool that the way this God set this up, because if this had just been Solomon speaking, uh, you, you would kind of get the feeling he was uh, pretty biased, wouldn't you? 
after he tells uh, the women have to meet this standard. I remember one time when Christy and I were in the midst of a, a theological debate. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it that. And, and it was heated in the moment. Um, you know, as iron sharpens iron, there were sparks flying. <laughs> and Proverbs 31 came up. I did not bring it up. I didn't go that far. Uh, but Proverbs 31 was brought up. And she was very frustrated, and she says, well, if this is what I'm responsible for, and this is all I have to live up to, what do you have to do? I said, all the rest. Uh, every, everything that it's not saying wives, where it says husbands or men, that's me. That's, that's my responsibility. Okay? Um, and I think a lot of times uh, this, this passage is used offensively to put women in their place. That, that's not it at all. This is the, the love of the mother being poured out on her son, preparing him and guiding him for a, a spouse that, you know, how does it start? The, the woman who fears the Lord. Okay? So, I want to read just a couple of verses here. An excellent wife, uh, uh, verse 10, who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Down in verse 23, it makes a comment about her husband. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Now, why do you suppose they stuck that verse in there? Why? He's a respected man. He was not a man. She, uh, she is not doing anything to make him dishonored in the city gate. Okay? She starts off saying, uh, you know, an excellent wife who can find. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. So... The woman of excellent repute is working toward the benefit of her husband. Uh, how many of you have seen The War Room? Okay. Um, we have it for rent in the library. I would encourage you to rent it. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the premise about this. Uh, essentially, there is a, a couple that are at a very difficult spot in their marriage. Uh, they are both professing Christians. Uh, she's a realtor, and, and he's a pharmaceutical salesman. And uh, you, you can just tell that things are not going well for them. Um, they both attend church, but uh, they're, they're just not getting it. Um, and the wife, she, she meets this elderly lady who's putting her house on the market. And through the course of the exchange, um, they come to uh, meet once a week so that the older woman can teach the younger woman. And the first time they meet for this, uh, the wife is just going on and on about what a terrible person her husband is. And the older woman, I, I absolutely love her, mm -hmm. because she says, you know, I, I just stop. How much of our time am I going to have to give up listening to you whine about your husband? Okay. She said something that I thought was very profound. She said in her marriage to her husband, she came to realize that when she was bad-mouthing and talking down about her husband, that she was targeting the wrong enemy. She was targeting her own marriage. And that's not the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. Satan. You betcha. Say the world. The, the world doesn't like you either. And our own flesh. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't need to worry about the devil or the world. We get into all the trouble on our own. Mm -hmm. Okay? But so often, we get so consumed with the injury done us, the slights done us, the wounds given to us, 
that we forget who we are wrestling against. Now, I don't know anybody that likes the word submit. Okay. I don't know anyone. But I want to give you a couple of examples of submission. Actually, I'm, I'm going to give one that is significant and one that we've touched on before. Um, Peter, in writing his letter, who does he use as the example of a holy woman? Sarah. 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 And, and how does he hold her up as an example? She submitted to Abraham. Now, honestly, Abraham did some stupid things. Uh, oh, her? Her? Oh, she's my sister. Twice. Yeah, once wasn't enough. He did it twice. Well, it worked out so well the first time. Let's do it again. I, okay. So we know Abraham wasn't perfect. But when Sarah submitted to him, what happened? Who took care of her? Did God take care of her? Did he leave her to her husband's foolishness? No. Oh no, God stepped up and defended her, actually before the kings of the land. And said, no, no, you don't touch this one. Okay? So, submit. In the Greek, the word for submit is hupotasso. Yes, it is. <laughs> and the word is actually uh, used in the military at the time. And it's talking about the officer that places his authority underneath the superior officer. He chooses to serve under someone other than himself. Okay? We get the word submit. Now, let's talk about submission for a moment. We see that uh, Sarah submitted to Abraham. Um, but can you think of anyone else that submitted to somebody that he really should not have submitted to? That really there was no purpose? Dave? David and Saul. David and yeah. Saul? Absolutely. David would not raise his hand against the God-appointed ruler of the land. Anybody else? Hmm. Let's talk about Luke chapter 2. Flip there with me, if you will. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2. This is the uh, Christmas story, right after the Christmas story. Uh, we see at the beginning of chapter 2 the birth of Jesus, the shepherds and the angels. The presentation of Jesus uh, at the temple, and then them going back to Nazareth. Um, but down here in verse 41, there's kind of a peculiar story that's put out. And it, it kind of seems like it doesn't really fit. Okay. Um, so in verse 41, now his parents, his being Jesus, uh, parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking, asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw them, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father, my mother never used that word. <laughs> my mom never said behold. <laughs> Mostly it was watch it. <laughs> Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. Now listen to what it says here. 
and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, guess what that word is? Submit. Submit. It's hupatasso. You have the God that spoke everything into existence submitting himself to the flawed teaching and parenting of Mary and Joseph. Now, he's 12 years old. We know that Mary and Joseph had a number of children. We know they had at least three more boys and at least two girls. Uh, if they were um, as prolific as most Jews were at that day, there could have been, you know, 11 siblings at the time. So when they were headed home, uh, you know, it's one kid. You're not going to miss. Who's going to miss one kid? Uh, we have a story that actually went like this. Uh, we had all my, when we were in Houston, my whole family, uh, we had met together. We were going to go to dinner. And uh, so we had my parents and then my brother Scott and his family and Todd and his family, uh, Christy and I and our family, Amber and her family, and Keith and his son. And we got in the cars, and, and uh, our the cousins, they were interchangeable parts. You know, we just switched and swapped, and uh, we started to drive away. And Christy said, did you see Benjamin? <laughs> said, yeah, he's about this tall, brown hair. <laughs> we better check. So we went, my brother lives on a cul-de-sac, so we made the loop. Hey, you guys got Benjamin? Nope. Is Benjamin with you guys? Nope. Do you guys have Benjamin? Nope. Hmm. So being the intelligent people that we are, we went back in the house, and in the back bedroom where the video game was, <laughs> sat Benjamin playing the video game, completely oblivious that everybody had left the house. I admire his focus. <laughs> okay, because you have 20, almost 25 people all getting coats on and yelling and hollering and walking out the door and then complete silence. <laughs> now, it didn't take us a day, and we didn't take three days to find him. My brother's house is significantly smaller than Jerusalem. Okay, but they come back and they're talking to him. They said, I mean, how do you suppose that Joseph and Mary felt? I mean, this is four days, possibly five days, because it said they went a day's journey and then they started looking for him. So a day back, that's two days, and then they look for three days, so five days. And, and you know, I, I love... Mary, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. My, my, my parents were not like that. <laughs> I, I remember being young one time across the street from where we grew up was a canyon, and they had these little, um, I don't know what they were, uh, plants with round kind of rubbery green leaves, and it was San Diego, so there was no such thing as snow. So my brother and I used to take cardboard boxes, and we'd sit at the top of the hill on a cardboard box, and we'd go down the slope on these little green plants. Uh, and we were very excited about what we were doing, and we missed the call for dinner. Um, this was back in the day, uh, you know, when your parents would, could say to you, and, and mine did say to me, go, don't come back till dinner. <laughs> it was before I had a watch, certainly before I was allowed to have a cell phone. Um, the only guideline that we really had was the street lights. Mm -hmm. And you, you knew you had to come in before the street lights came on. Um, and so we were out and we were playing and he and I both realized, hmm, kind of hungry. Mm -hmm. And we went home and guess what? Dinner had been served and cleaned and put away. And we went without dinner that night because we didn't come home in time for dinner. So I, I understand how this could have been. Um, you know, my parents were, were uh, certainly reacted a lot differently than Mary and Joseph. My parents were like, man, you don't eat. 
So, but Jesus submitted to them. He willingly placed him under their authority, even though really they had no authority over him. Right? Well, there's another example that I want to give you. Give you. Uh, turn with me in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple of verses before I get to the passage that I want, just so you have it in context. Starting in verse 1, uh, Paul writes, he says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourself. You know, we could preach an entire sermon just off of that passage right there, couldn't we? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Uh, just real quick, a, a commentary from Pastor um, this church does an incredible job with this verse. Uh, you guys are, are amazing. Uh, all we need to do is make the need known, and you guys step up, and you, you take care of it. So um, not to swell your heads, but definitely you give commendation where it's due. Um, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, if we stop right there, I could just lay out for you that wives... This is the kind of call that you are called to. To choose to humble yourself. Okay? And, and to look at your husband and to put his needs above yours. Husbands, don't worry, I'm going to get to you too. Okay? Because this is not a one-sided thing. Okay? So I could leave it right there and just say, hey, this is how God wants you to act. And, and that would be right, because that's scripture. But God didn't stop there, did he? God didn't even put a chapter break there. You know, because God did that. But in verse 9, it says, Therefore, because he humbled himself, because of his humility, not, I mean, just think about this for a moment, how humiliating it must be for the God of the universe, the creator of all things, to come down and be man. And then you add on top of that, as a man, he was not given the recognition to him. He wasn't exalted as a king or a lord or a master. He was a humble teacher from Galilee. Okay? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, let's look at what this picture is really showing us with Kupatasso. Wives, you are precious in God's sight. You are honored in God's sight. He has called you to a high calling. We have got to break the cultural mindset that we are fed multiple times every day. Okay? The mindset that to serve is denigrating. To be served is honoring. 
That's not what Scripture says. That's not how Scripture portrays it. That's not what God has called us to. As a matter of fact, he's warned us multiple times, be humble, or he will humble you. It's a lot easier to choke down your pride and be humble first than it is for him to come and put you in your place. Those lessons sting. Okay? So what is the model for submission? I think Jesus made that very clear. I mean, when Paul wrote, he uses Jesus as the example, both for men and for women. He, he's the one that we both look to. Well, how did Jesus model leadership? He served. The Last Supper. In making a point about leadership, he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, hey, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to become a servant. And it's so sad that in our families, we, we tend to treat each other so significantly worse than we do people we don't even know. Uh, Will Rogers said at one point, I think it was Will Rogers, uh, he said, treat your family like friends and your friends like family. And I, I, that's something that I, I really work to try and remember because it's so easy when family's around to just let your ugly hang out all over everywhere. Okay? But you don't do that with your friends because you want them to like you. So why, why would we do it to our family? So submitting yourself to your husband is an honor position. God has given you a high calling. Now men, I'm going to touch on this just a little bit and then I'm going to try and wrap this whole thing up. It won't be next week, but probably after the first of the year. So men, uh, bring your big boy pants because <laughs> you're going to eat crow. Okay? Um, so wives, God has called you to submit, to respect, to honor. And if you notice in Ephesians chapter 5, he spent quite a bit more time talking about the men's role than he did talking about the women's role. Um, when God spoke to the husbands, he used uh, the word. He said, husbands, love your wives. And now why do you suppose God told husbands to love their wives, but he didn't tell wives to love their husbands? Would you go ahead and put that slide up real quick? I, I've got a question up here that I would like you guys just on your own. Don't, don't say anything out loud. I want you to answer this question. If you had to choose, I'm trying to make sure I'm out of everybody's way, would you rather be alone and unloved or inadequate and disrespected? Now, there's a woman uh, named Shanti Feldman that uh, she was actually doing a survey uh, of men. She wrote a book. It's called, I believe it's called For Women Only. Um, and Christy was actually reading this book in bed one night, and she asked me this question. Up here, if you had to choose one, there was no option other than these two, which would you choose? Would you rather be alone and unloved? Those that would rather be alone and unloved, put your hands up. Okay, now, look, keep your hands up, keep them up, keep them up. You gotta choose one or the other. Would you rather be alone and unloved? Okay. Now, put your hands down. Or would you rather be disrespected and inadequate? Put your hand up if you'd rather be disrespected and inadequate. <laughs> That's interesting. 75% of men that were polled on this question, so that's three out of four, said they would prefer to be alone and unloved. When Christy asked me that question, I told her, yeah, I'd, I'd much rather be alone and unloved than disrespected and inadequate. And she was floored. Women don't really get that too much because their native language is love. Okay? Agape. Uh, and, and I believe it was the same survey. Um, the men were also asked, do you feel like your wife loves you? And almost across the board, they said, absolutely. And then they were asked, does your wife like you? Mm -hmm. And almost across the board, they said, 
Not really. <laughs> now, that's, that's interesting because Scripture addresses that question exactly on target. Okay? So men are called to agapeo. Agape. They are called to unconditionally love their wives. That the model for this is Jesus Christ who loved the church and gave himself up for the church. Now, I don't know very many men that wouldn't take a bullet for their wives. Not from their wives. <laughs> okay. I am not endorsing severe reprimand here. Okay. Um, because that's a one and done thing. But most men don't understand that the husband's duty in a marriage is to always be at work with his wife, to show her that he loves her. And, and the ways that we shall love her are radically, radically different. Okay? So husbands are called to agape, but wives are not. Why do you suppose that is? I, I think it's because most women unconditionally love at the start. That's, that's where their heart is. Okay? Now we know in scripture that there are three words that are used to describe, the, that we translate as love. And, and this is you know, the, the highest form of love. This is the term that is always used in the Greek when God loves us. It's unconditional. It's based on him, not on us. Okay? And that's what men, we're called to love our wives as God has loved us unconditionally. Okay? Now you notice that uh, in Colossians, you know, let, let me stop. I'm going to finish this thought first. Uh, Titus chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there with me if you would. Um, Paul is talking to Titus. This is one of the pastoral epistles. He's basically showing him the guidelines as to what he should be looking at in his call and role as a pastor. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, he, he, he says to Titus, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. All right, older men, I'm not sure where that line is. Okay? I'm pretty sure I'm not there yet. So set me an example. Okay? Older men, this is what we're called to. And then in verse 3, it says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Huh. <laughs> They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, in verse 4, the, what the older women are to teach the younger women is to train the young women to love their husbands. Now, interestingly enough, this word is not agape. Okay? This is not the unconditional love that men are called to love their wives with. This is phileo. And at its base root of it is to be their friend. To like them. To let them know that you like them. That that's, that's the woman's learning to love is to learning to their, love their husbands in a way that their husbands feel like they like them. That, that, that blows my mind. You know? Because uh, there were a lot of times in our marriage that I could say absolutely without a doubt, Christy loves me, but uh, likes me? Why not? Probably not. Because there was a, a number of years where Christy had to go to the grocery store every day, and every day it took her four hours. <laughs> and she would come home with a sandwich. Okay, there was a period of time where I was pretty sure she didn't like me. Okay, um, and and ironically enough, during that time, I was not agape agape her. I, I was not loving her unconditionally.